Good morning, everybody. Thank you. I'd also, I thought you got drowned on the way in, which uh, I'm going to read this morning, uh, not the whole of Mark 13, but um, three sections of it. And I'll begin with Mark 13 from the first verse. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things happen and what will be the sign that they're about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumours of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of the birth pains. And then skipping down to verse 24. But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather the elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And then verse 37, the end of the chapter. What I say to you, I say to everyone. What? Thanks be to God for his word. Uh, there was a notice. Uh, no, there wasn't a notice. Uh, there was a, I'm in church, aren't I? It must be a notice. Uh, there was um, a story in the news recently, which you, you may or may not have caught, about the Crooked House pub near Dudley. We should have a picture of it coming up. Uh, Dudley in the West Midlands. Did you hear the story? Oh, you did. We... No, absolutely. <laughs> We've got family up there, so we sort of noticed it, and I'm really pleased you did. The Crooked House pub um, has been described as Britain's wonkiest inn. It was built in 1765, originally as a corn mill, and it began listing due to mining subsidence somewhere in the 1800s. Then, after a suspicious fire last year, it was demolished. And so that's what it ended up looking like. But as Deb's just said, that aroused such fury, the owners have been ordered to rebuild it just as it was. It really did uh, stir up quite a, 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 a to-do. Uh, the leader of South Staffordshire Council, Roger Lee, said, a huge amount of time and resources have been put into investigating the unauthorised demolition of the Crookest House pub. We've had great support from the local community, from our MPs, from Andy Street, the Mayor of the West Midlands. The Crooked House, he went on, was a black country icon that's attracted attention, get this, from all over the world. So if you haven't heard this story, catch up, people. Our passage this morning talks about the destruction of an even greater icon. The destruction of Herod's magnificent Jerusalem temple. 
And I have to tell you, there was nothing wonky about this edifice. It had been built to impress, like lots of buildings in London and other major capital cities around the world are built to impress. I wonder what sort of buildings have impressed you. I'd go for Durham Cathedral, half Church of God, half Castle Gates the Scots. Other cathedrals are available. Or perhaps somewhere like Blenheim Palace. Have you ever been to some of these great stately homes built to celebrate uh, the pomp and the power of their builders? Or, or somewhere, I guess, like the Burj Khalifa? In, in um, is that in Dubai it is, isn't it? Um, the, the tallest towers, tower, I'm sure it's something else is now taller. Towers get taller and taller as a sign of prosperity and esteem and power. The Jerusalem temple was exactly like one of those buildings. The Jerusalem temple for those first century disciples was infinitely more magnificent than any building they had ever seen. Of course, it impressed them. As Jesus was leaving the temple, we hear, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what massive stones, what a magnificent building. Jesus looked at this powerful complex of buildings. Do you see these great buildings? He replies, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. A bit later, we're told, Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. And it, it's worth noting that word opposite. There's a sense of a, a face-off, a, a confrontation building. Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple when Peter and James and John and Andrew ask him privately, tell us, when will these things happen and what will be the sign that they're about to happen? Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumours of wars, don't be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginnings of the birth pains. Mark 13, if you've had a chance to read it all through, is a dramatic and in lots of ways a confusing chapter. And it mirrors the dramatic and the confusing time it was written in. These were tumultuous days for the people of Jerusalem. Less than 35 years after Jesus said all this, in AD 66, those rumblings against Roman rule that we hear in the background of Jesus' last days, they erupt into open rebellion. There's an uprising in Jerusalem that is brutally crushed by the Romans. The temple's sacked, it's desecrated, and it's destroyed. And so many Jews are crucified that the hills around Jerusalem are denuded of trees so they could find enough wood for all the crosses. No quarter was given, no mercy was shown. And Jesus could see all this coming. And he warns his friends, these will be days of distress, unrivaled, from the beginning of time. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, these images of slaughter and suffering, they all sound so very familiar, don't they? They're the sort of images that we see on our television screens every day. These days of suffering and distress that Jesus could see coming for the people of Jerusalem in his day are so distressingly echoed in our world today. In 
the unheard pleas of thousands and thousands of Palestinians, men, women, and children, who are now facing starvation. And I just need to pause before the next picture comes up and issue a warning. The next picture, some of you will find it extremely disturbing. Another picture of Palestinians in, Israel, in, in, in Gaza facing starvation. In the unheard of pleas of thousands upon thousands of Palestinians and in the long drawn out agony of war in Ukraine, stirring up fear as people wonder what Putin's going to do next. In South Sudan again and again, in the despair of the women of Afghanistan. It was International Women's Day last weekend, wasn't it? Women whose hopes of education and a career and a life have been snatched away again as they become more and more confined and controlled. And here at home, in this country, in the struggle of families, where there are now twice as many food banks as there are McDonald's. This chapter describes the tumultuous and frightening and desperate times that are so familiar because they're times just like ours. And in the midst of such tumultuous times, what does Jesus say to his followers? What is it that this passage is saying to us this morning? Well, the word that rings out from this chapter is the word watch. It's there in verse 5, watch out. And again in verse 9, be on your guard. And verse 23, in verse 35, keep watch. And then the very last word of this chapter is watch. I will say that again, watch. Watch where you're putting your trust. Watch that you don't get distracted. And we will come back to those. But before all of that, Jesus calls them as he calls us. In these days when it feels sometimes as if the world's falling apart, when the news feels so unrelentingly bad that many of us have stopped watching it. Supremely, in these days, Jesus calls us to watch in hope. You see... In this chapter, Jesus is talking about two different futures, two different horizons. He's talking about the imminent future, the destruction that's imminently coming upon Jerusalem, the death and destruction that fell upon Jerusalem only 30 years after Jesus issued this warning. The sort of future that keeps recurring through human history, that keeps on happening again and again and again. On the one hand, Jesus is talking about things that would happen within the lifetime of of his followers. But on the other hand, Jesus is also pointing towards the ultimate future, to the future that God will bring at the end of time, when Jesus will return and make all things new. When you hear of wars and rumours of wars, says Jesus, Don't be alarmed. When nations rise up against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms, when there are earthquakes in various places and famines, these are the beginnings of the birth pains. The beginnings of creations laboring to give birth to God's future. I remember when our first son was born, We weren't surrounded by family and friends who had babies. There weren't a lot of babies around us in our lives. So I remember going into the delivery room and seeing a cot there in the corner and actually thinking, before I leave this room, there will be a baby in that cot. And yes, I'd been pregnant for the usual nine months and one week. But I was still in the process of making a connection between being pregnant and the arrival of an actual baby. And of course, there were a lot of labour pains to get through before the joy of, of the new birth. 
These are the beginnings of the birth pains, says Jesus. And he's, he's using a picture that the Apostle Paul picks up later in the book of Romans in chapter 8, when Paul says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. What Paul's saying is that because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, we know that this, that this we see and know and experience all around us, that this isn't the end of the story. There is a future beyond all the pain. Jesus is reminding his disciples of what they already knew through the Old Testament scriptures, that all of this that we see out playing around us in these days and all through history, all of this, is not the end of the story. And we have even more than the Old Testament scriptures. We know that because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, we know that the day is coming when the victory of God's love will be revealed and established in all the earth. The day is coming when God will wipe away every tear from every eye, and there will be an end to death and to mourning and to crying and to pain. That's the hope we'll be celebrating against next week, again next week, as we walk with Jesus to the cross and watch him being crushed by the evils, by the sin, by the sheer wrong of this world. But, but we know that that wasn't the end of the story because three days later it is the power of God's love that proves even stronger than all the power of sin and death and hell as God raises Jesus from the grave so that we can say we can say on Easter morning and every day praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Christ Jesus from the dead. And it's knowing that the agony of our world isn't the end of the story that gives us courage to face days like these. Because we know that the upheavals going on in the world around us are the beginning of the birth pain. But that doesn't make any of this easy. I also remember a few weeks before David, our first son, was born, walking down the road in Oxford where we were living and realising that the only way out of this, the only way out of being pregnant, the only way forward from this point was through the scary process of giving birth. And of course, you know, it's rarely over quite as quickly as it is in Call the Midwife. <laughs> Ladies, we will share stories later. That's all right. But giving birth can be a painful and a bloody and sometimes a traumatic and even in the past a dangerous time. But it's also a time filled with so much hope, so much promise. And once it's over... Eventually, the memory of the pain dissolves in the joy of a new life. The first thing God is doing by his spirit through this passage this morning is refreshing us in the hope he gives us in Jesus. Let's just take a moment to absorb that hope afresh, to breathe it in again, to so let it begin to warm our hearts, to lift the despair, to renew our strength, even to reawaken the glimmer of joy afresh. The first thing this passage calls us to this morning is to watch in hope. And the second thing is to watch where we put our trust. 
Following Jesus will always mean swimming against the tide. It will always mean marching to the beat of a different drum, seeing life in a, in a new and in a different light. Jesus, you remember, sits opposite the temple. And as he looks at that great building, that great building that looks so solid, so permanent, so dependable, something that you can put your trust in, he says, in effect, none of these things can be guaranteed. Don't put your trust in them. Put your trust in me. The Jesus who sat opposite the temple reminds us that all of those things that we have been taught to put our trust in, things like our finances, our jobs, our status, our way of life, none of them will stand forever. None of those things, says Jesus, can be guaranteed. So make sure you don't put your trust in them. Put your trust in me. But living like that, living trusting Jesus like that, at least in my experience, is something that we learn bit by bit. The transferring of trust, letting go of things that we've been taught to trust in, and learning to trust more and more in Jesus is a lifetime's journey, isn't it? It's a lifetime's journey that culminates, I guess, in that final act of trusting as we trust Jesus, as we die. It's a bit by bit process. Two weeks ago here at Haywards Heath, it was your gift day, do you remember? And uh, David was preaching. And uh, for a little while he was talking about money. And do you remember he encouraged us just to try giving a bit more than is comfortable? Do you remember that? I thought that was really helpful. It helped me. Because that's how trust builds, isn't it? Taking the next step that Jesus is asking of us, and then the next one, and then the next one, as we allow God's Spirit to transfer our trust from things that will crumble to the one whose love will never fail. Which begs the question, of course, What's the next step that Jesus is asking us to take, that he's asking you and me to take? Because no matter how long we've been a Christian, there is always the next step. Watch in hope. Watch where we put our trust. And thirdly and finally, watch that you don't get distracted. Distracted from what? Distracted from the priority, says Jesus, of making this good news known. It's what David was, this David was talking about at the beginning of our service. Be on your guard, says Jesus. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. The gospel must be preached to all nations to all nations and to all people. Just like Jesus says in his very last words in Matthew's Gospel, his last words to his followers, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to observe all I have taught you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. But notice, would you? that it's in the context of their sharing their faith that Jesus promises to be with them. We often pull that promise out of its context, don't we? A few years ago, Peter, my husband, and I took a team of students from Spurgeon's College uh, to Calcutta, where we had the opportunity of seeing all sorts of things that Christians are doing all across West Bengal, and doing often at real cost, sacrificial cost to themselves. Part of the time there we spent with some of the Big Life teams. I've told you about Big Life before, this movement that's planting churches that plant churches, that's spreading uh, all across that part of, uh, of the world and, and in Europe too. 
But while we were there, um, among other things, our team went with one of the big life teams on an evangelistic trip to villages close to the border between India and Bangladesh. And, and the team we were with was led, like all of the big life teams, by some young pastors, young men the same sort of age as some of the students who were with us. And uh, these young Indian pastors spoke much more candidly to the students than they would ever have thought of doing to us more senior people, you know? Now, they'd had a number of teams going out from the UK to see what God was doing with them. And uh, from spending time with lots of teams, they had sized up us Western Christians pretty well. The problem with you Christians in the West, they said, is that you have lost your first love of Jesus. And of course, they were right, weren't they? But do you know what I wanted to say to them? I wanted to say to them, yes, you're right, but would you please come and live where we live and show us how not to lose our first love living where we live? Because it's not easy, is it? In our comfortable, secure lives, it feels almost inevitable. And yet, one of the ways of keeping our relationship with God alive, of keeping our faith growing and joyful, is by sharing that faith with others. Faith gets bigger as we give it away, as we share it. And we all have a part to play in that. I won't say tell me, because I won't ask you actually to tell me at the moment, though I suspect you could. Tell me what difference does knowing Jesus make to you? I'm not asking what difference should it make. I'm asking what difference does it make? Because it, it means something, doesn't it? And as you're thinking how you, what you would say to, to a friend, to somebody at work or wherever, please don't worry if what you're thinking Jesus means to you sounds very ordinary, because so often that's exactly what people need to hear. They need to hear things that they can identify with as human beings. So say it in your own words. Not in Christian jargon, which is utterly uncomprehensible to people outside the church very often. And it's often a very real turn-off to people. They can't identify with it. But what difference does knowing Jesus make to you? And in these days when life feels so dark for so many, who do you know who desperately needs hope? Who do you know who needs a better story to live by? Who needs a better story than the empty stories they've been peddled by this world? Yes, the church is here to embody and to show the love of God for our neighbours. But the church is also here to share the story of Jesus. And this morning, as we come to share the Lord's Supper together... The same Jesus who challenged his disciples on the Mount of Olives is here with us. Here with a heart, yes, full of love for us, but so full of love for his world. And he's asking us to share a message that is so full of hope. And if we don't, who will? Watch in hope. Watch where we put our trust and watch that we don't get distracted. And as we come to communion, we come to one who knows how far short we fall, but whose grace is deeper than all our failure, whose love is stronger than all our fear, and who comes in this communion meal to feed us afresh with living bread to sustain us, and with the wine of the kingdom of God to gladden our hearts again as we share his love with his world. Thanks be to God.